All right. Well, um, thank you everybody for not being here. Um, we're, we're here at Tech still. Um, Sarah Carpentier and Jim Fraser in the room, um, but uh, we are forging ahead and, and getting this thing done. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about some of the work um, towards my dissertation looking at piping plovers and, and landscape change. So habitat loss and the degradation of habitat quality, both literally and functionally, are related to population declines in wildlife worldwide. So as you can see in this um, image here, um, I hope you can see it, is that although there is an abundance of sand, um, which might be the correct substrate for many species, the presence of humans, vehicles, and, and all the tire marks may make this habitat less suitable for piping for any species, except people. And in few systems have the effects of habitat loss been felt more strongly than in systems that were historically naturally dynamic due to regular disturbance. So for example, um, in fire dependent systems, in prairies with landscape scale natural grazers, and rivers with national, natural flood dynamics, these are all examples of landscapes in which disturbances can act positively on the native wildlife. However, all of the, these disturbances have also been inhibited by humans in one way or another, um, reducing population persistence of the disturbance-dependent taxa. So for example, in fire-dependent systems, we have the Bachman sparrows that will reduce occupancy of a site or abandon it after just three years of a site not being burned. Of course, the lesser prairie chicken that requires um, habitat heterogeneity um, for um, many stages of its life cycle between breeding and nesting and, and brooding, and the pallid sturgeon that requires river connectivity and wild water for reproduction. Barrier islands, these long narrow strips of sand that uh, lie adjacent to much of the Atlantic coast are also highly disturbed and dependent, um, disturbance dependent landscapes. So during storms such as hurricanes or nor nor'easters, ocean water can wash over um, the islands changing both the geomorphic uh, shape of the island, but also removing and burying vegetation. However, in much of the same systems, efforts are often undertaken to reduce the effects of storms um, on the system, such as by building dunes, uh, planting them with American beach grass, or, or putting up uh, fences to encourage, um, encourage the building of dunes. And so this might negatively affect the native wildlife that have evolved to be in these naturally disturbed, um, dis disturbed landscapes. So the piping plovers are one of these species. They are beach nesting shorebirds that are listed as threatened and endangered under the United States Endangered Species Act. Uh, they breed um, in the orange areas on this map, um, but are generally designated into three populations. So the Great Plains population and the Atlantic Coast population, which are federally threatened, um, and the Great Lakes population, which is federally endangered. Um, for this project, we only monitored plovers um, on the breeding grounds. But from nest site selection studies across the range, as well as observations of plovers, we know that generally they select for wide, open, sparsely vegetated sand. They generally avoid vegetation in order to um, avoid detection by and improve their detection of fearsome terrestrial predators. They also need to select for habitat that will help them uh, avoid aerial predators, such as owls and falcons. And throughout their range, they tend to select for low energy, moist intertidal foraging habitat that has higher invertebrate abundances. And so plovers spend about five months on the breeding grounds, and this is a very dynamic time for them. So they arrive in March and April, where they set up socially monogamous pairs and defend territories. They then initiate um, nests and small scrapes in the sand on the ground which hatch precocial chicks, which can forage for themselves just hours after hatch. Both adults tend to them for most of the, the brood rearing period. And then once they can fledge around 25 days after hatch, um, adults and fledglings prepare to move south for the winter. Piping plovers in many of um, parts of their range are also regulated by density dependent effects. 
So decreases in habitat amount can increase local densities of piping plovers, which as I said are territorial, and thus have a minimum amount of space required to complete their life cycle. When densities increase, antagonistic interactions can also increase, as well as ter territorial exclusion can cause some individuals to be precluded from quality habitat, thus reducing the average reproductive output and limiting population growth. And so this brings us to the general theme of my dissertation, which is how does habitat change, natural or otherwise, affect breeding piping plovers? Because piping plovers are reliant on this open, sparsely vegetated sand, which requires regular disturbance, but the availability of that habitat is not particularly widespread, piping plovers have been shown to be habitat limited through multiple studies and across much of the range. However, occasionally the size of the disturbance is large enough um, that any efforts to um, any efforts to reduce it are not effective, um, and thus pi piping plovers in those areas may no longer be habitat limited. And therefore, we could see changes um, in the local piping plover populations through population change. Um, all of the constituent el elements can be affected by this, such as births, deaths, immigration, and emigration. But we could also see changes in habitat suitability, as well as species interaction, both intra and interspecific. And so we've seen this time and time again where um, habitat is created from some event and populations respond positively. So for example, here on the left, you see a, a pre-Hurricane Isabel image. Um, and on the right, we see a post-Hurricane Im um, Isabel image, which I have classified. Um, and the light gray is um, dry sand, which we would consider nesting habitat. So as you can see, the um, habitat following the storm is now no longer um, fragmented, but there's also simply more of it. And in all sorts of these instances, we saw corresponding population increases. And so um, here's an example from this specific island, um, Matompkin Island um, in Virginia, where the dotted line is the um, hurricane and then the population increased, and, and it did so in all of these cases. And so this brings us to our focal habitat creating event, Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Sandy made landfall on the Atlantic coast in October of 2012 and made broad scale geologic changes to um, many barrier islands. So sand was moved across islands and some places flattening dunes and creating these wide open areas um, of sand that I've said piping plovers tend to like. In other areas, they also created um, access across the entirety of the island. So where there was previously only oceanfront habitat, there was now also bayside habitat, which is ten, tends to be lower energy and have more invertebrates. And so generally, we just wanted to understand how plovers responded to this increase in habitat. And so to orient us back on the species range, um, here's the map I showed before, just blown up. And we worked with piping plovers on barrier islands um, off of Long Island in New York. Specifically, we worked on fire in West Hampton Island, um, two barrier islands um, off of Long Island. These islands were managed by a variety of state, federal, and county um, land managers. And we also worked on a portion of West Hampton Island um, in the pink in this image, um, Cupsog Beach County Park. What you can also see is our study area was split by two inlets. We have Old Inlet, which was created by Hurricane Sandy and remains open. It's in a um, National Park Service wilderness area. And then Marichis Inlet, which separates Fire Island from West Hampton Island um, and is a dredged inlet. And so here's an idea of what the hurricane um, effects looked like on a portion of our study area. So here is some pre-hurricane imagery from 2010. Um, as you can see, it's primarily oceanfront um, beaches with uh, vegetated back, back areas. And then following the storm in 2013, there were wide overwashes. Um, and also there was this area here on this image specifically, which breached by the storm which breached from the storm, meaning ocean water could flow um, north to the bay, and, um, but this site was uh, filled by the Army Corps of Engineers soon after the storm. 
Now, seven years after the storm, much of this habitat is reverting to um, pre-hurricane states due to vegetation succession. So you can see many of the, many of the areas that were previously um, open sand and unvegetated have revegetated. Following the initial island changes, there was concern about the ability of these barrier islands to function as protective barriers for the mainland. So due to this concern, the United States Army Corps of Engineers stabilized the island by filling breaches, building dunes, and planting American beach grass, which you can see um, on the left-hand side of this image. And all of this had the potential to affect new and existing piping plover habitat. In response to this, two restoration areas were built between the 2014 and 2015 breeding season to mitigate for the potential loss of nesting habitat. And you can see one of those on the right hand side of this image. These areas that were created um, as restoration areas were previously less suitable for piping plovers. Um, they, they were vegetated or dredged spoil sites. Um, and so the, the creation of these areas was um, making or improving habitat within their footprint. And so here's just another quick look at the two restoration areas. There's New Maid on the left and Great Gun on the right. Um, they obviously differ a lot in size, um, placement on the island, um, as well as building characteristics. So I know that was a lot, and so I just kind of want to orient you in time um, where all these things were happening. So Hurricane Sandy occurred again in the fall of 2012. We started monitoring piping plovers on Fire Island in 2013. The restoration areas were built between the 2014 and 2015 breeding seasons. And what I also didn't mention was there were two um, mange outbreaks in the local red fox population. Red foxes are um, uh, one of the primary terrestrial predators of piping plovers. So these two mange outbreaks occurred on either side of that old inlet that I talked about. So one was late in the 2015 breeding season and one was in the 2017 breeding season. And so we also had to consider these moving forward. And so for today, we're gonna to be focusing on the final three of my dissertation chapters. The first will be how did the Fire Island piping plover population respond to Hurricane Sandy and engineered habitat creation? The second, what determines differences in breeding adult piping plover habitat selection and suitability? And then finally, what post-hurricane landscape features are driving plover chick ecology? Of course, in order to um, do all of this, we had to go out into the field and collect some data. So we would go out into the field in the spring, um, we would monitor the birds and um, begin recording when they initiated nests. Um, if a nest was initiated um, and reached full clutch before we could find it, we would um, float the eggs to estimate initiation date. We were trapping adult plovers um, on their nests and primarily banding them with individually coded alphanumeric flags. If a bird was already banded, we would um, occasionally just observe incubation to um, confirm when they entered into a breeding stage. We also were banding um, chicks with the same individually coded flags. And then throughout the whole breeding season, we were monitoring the adults, monitoring the chicks and counting brood size um, and recording any banded individuals. So that brings me to my first objective for today, which was um, understanding population change following Hurricane Sandy. The first objective of this section was um, to understand how have demographic rates contributed to population change on Fire Island following Hurricane Sandy. And the second was how have the built restoration areas performed since their creation in 2015. And so again, we looked at this through all of the constituent elements of population change, birth, death, immigration, and emigration. To address these objectives, we built an integrated population model which integrated a logistic exposure model for nest survival, a young survival for brood survival, young survival model for brood survival, which we also combined for reproductive output, which is the number of chicks fledged per pair. We also used a Barker survival model for um, age specific um, true survival as well as fidelity rates. 
We could combine these with our pair counts to understand what the composition of our population was in terms of natal recruits, so individuals that hatched in the population and returned to breed, returning adults, and then the remainder of that would be um, immigrants. And then from our pair counts, we could estimate the population growth rate, and with those fidelity estimates, we could also estimate the number of individuals leaving the population in each year. To understand the restoration areas, we specifically looked at them in terms of nest success, brood survival, as well as those fidelity rates to understand changes in reproductive output and population growth, comparing the restoration areas to the rest of the study area. So what did we find? Um, as we've seen from past habitat creating events, um, the population did increase. On average, we saw a 12% annual increase and, and a 90% increase since Hurricane Sandy um, up to 2018. So for some of the specific demographic rates estimated from this model, um, what we're looking at here is an image with um, where the point is a, a mean estimate and then the bars are the corresponding error in that estimate. And so we saw that for reproductive output, it was a highly variable rate um, in the six years following Hurricane Sandy. However, there was a generally increasing trend um, in overall reproductive output. As I said, we could estimate the number of natal recruits, adult returners, and immigrants in our population. And what we can see is that the population was primarily composed of returning adults and immigrants in each year with a lower proportion of individuals being um, natal recruits. Because we have those fidelity estimates, we could also estimate the number of individuals leaving the population. Um, and I retained the number of immigrants on this image so we could um, compare the two. So in teal, we have the number of breeding adults that left the population to breed elsewhere, which in each year is less than the number of immigrants that we had. The number of juvenile emigrants was also variable and generally followed the same trend as reproductive output. And so with estimates of all these parameters, we can now correlate them with annual population growth rates for an indicator of which parameter was contributing most to population change. And so we found that the number of immigrants in each year was correlated most highly with population growth rate. Um, so essentially, assuming that there is room for birds to move in, um, we may see continued, conti continued high population growth rate in this population. But we also saw that reproductive output um, was correlated less so, um, still correlated with population growth, just to a lesser degree. So to recap this first objective, we saw that um, immigration and reproductive output were primarily contributing to population change. And we could ask our second question is, how have the built restoration areas performed? So recall that we um, evaluated the restoration areas in terms of nest success, chick survival, and fidelity. And we saw that nest success, both of um, birds that hatched in the restoration areas and then returned to breed, and adults that were already breeding in the study area were less um, in the restoration areas. Um, but chick survival was higher in these sites. Because of the higher chick survival and lower nest success, we generally had similar reproductive output in the restoration areas as compared to the rest of the study area. And although there was considerable uncertainty in the population growth rates from the restoration areas, primarily due to um, lower sample size in those sites, population growth was um, generally the same um, when comparing the restoration areas to the rest of the study area. And so to summarize this, this first chapter, we saw that in terms of Fire Island, we had a 93% increase in population size um, after Hurricane Sandy, which was primarily due to immigration and reproductive output. In terms of the restoration areas, they had lower nest success and site fidelity, but higher chick survival, ultimately resulting in a similar population growth rate and um, reproductive output. Ultimately, the population increased another 28 pairs in 2019 with continued high reproductive output, immigration, um, and even more pairs in the restoration areas. So it seems that the restoration areas were performing well um, and, and did their job. <laughs>
So as I said, from this integrated population model, we found that adult plovers are important. The population is primarily composed of returning adults and immigrants in, this, in, in each year. And so our next objective was to understand habitat selection and suitability for adults on the breeding grounds, ideally with the goal of enhancing protections of the habitat most suitable for these um, ages. However, habitat selection is an inherently complex topic. So you can ask really broad scale question about habitat type preferences, such as does a bird wanna be in the marsh as compared to in the sand? You can also ask questions within habitat types. So if this bird is in the sand, do they wanna be closer or farther from or closer to the ocean in her tidal? However, you may also need to consider constraints in habitat selection, such as if a bird is, um, has a nest, are they selecting habitat differently because they need to be around that nest, as opposed to a bird that's free and can go wherever it would like on the landscape. And so we're interested in some of these questions for piping plovers because as I said, their five month breeding season is very, um, is very complex. They move throughout breeding stages. Um, both adults tend to the chicks, but they're not always tending to the chicks. And we also have just have limited knowledge about the spatially explicit habitat selection of these birds other than from their nests. And so therefore we hypothesize that habitat selection may be not just be simple and that it may instead be explained by breeding stage or behavior. And so we grouped each individual into three different um, classes based on um, either breeding stage. So were they pre-breeding, nesting, brooding, or post-breeding? We could also simplify this as habitat selection just explained by whether a bird is breeding or not. However, because individuals are um, occasionally, even when they are breeding, they're not attending to their chicks, we instead hypothesized perhaps that behavior could be explaining um, habitat selection. And so with these, we asked two primary questions. The first being, does selection vary by breeding stage or behavior? And if there is a stage that is um, explaining habitat selection, how are adult piping plovers within that stage selecting habitat? So of course we needed spatial data. Every time we saw an adult piping plover, we would collect its location using position offset methods. We also had aerial imagery flown of our study area, which we um, classified into a variety of habitat types and collected um, habitat data on the ground um, to uh, lay over the um, classifications. We evaluated habitat selection um, using second order selection using fixed effects logistic regression models. Um, so in this image, um, you can see used and random plover points where used points are in dark purple and the random points are in uh, lighter purple. And we, constrain, we only use locations in dry sand um, because this is the primary um, substrate habitat for piping plovers. And also because we didn't know what detection probability was in vegetation. So we also developed a variety of landscape metrics. Um, we looked at the proportion of vegetation around points as well as the proportion of dry sand. We created a variety of um, distance metrics. So here you can see the least cost distance to bay, um, which is how an individual would walk to bay in her tidal habitat. Um, we did the same for ocean and then created um, straight line distances to um, vegetation and development. And then we also had LIDAR flown in each year from which we created a digital elevation model and derived a slope layer. So we used model selection um, to understand whether um, breeding stage or behavior was explaining habitat selection. And we were also interested in whether there were differences among years, but each model had every habitat variable in it. And so what did we find? We found that an individual's um, instantaneous behavior, whether they were parental or not, um, best explained habitat selection in these birds, and that there were not differences among years. So, for example, a parental bird could be tending to their brood, incubating um, and incubating a nest, whereas a non-parental bird may be um, having an aggressive encounter with another plover or another bird or, or foraging. <clears throat> 
And so he, this image here you can see are the selection um, coefficients for each variable in the model. Um, LC just means least cost, so again, that um, walking to that, that feature. And so what we can see here is um, if we look at the way the, the points and those error bars um, overlap zero, we would um, conclude that that, that habitat feature was important um, or not to habitat selection for that behavioral stage. And so now I'm gonna specifically walk you through all of these relationships. So the most important um, landscape feature um, for plovers in both stages was the avoidance of vegetation. So when the amount of vegetation around points reached about 50%, um, both parental and non-parental birds were essentially ceasing use of those areas. We also saw that both parental and non-parental birds were avoiding areas of steeper slopes and wanted to be closer to the ocean intertidal. In terms of differences in selection, we can see for the proportion of dry sand around locations, parental birds were selecting um, for areas with more dry sand, whereas non-parental birds were avoiding areas um, with more dry sand, um, primarily then they were closer to um, moist sand. Both parental and non-parental birds were avoiding um, development. However, the effect of this was greater in non-parental birds. In terms of the least cost distance to the bay intertidal, we saw that parental birds were selecting for sites closer to the bay intertidal, whereas non-parental birds were not exhibiting selection for this, this resource. And then while parental and non-parental um, plovers were both avoiding areas of higher elevation, again, the effect was greater in non-parental birds. And so when we predict this onto the landscape, someone who's not so familiar with our study area might be like, well, those look the same. Um, so we have a lower suitable sites in blue moving, transitioning to a higher suitability in red. Um, and what we, we generally can see here is that um, many intertidal areas are, are predicting as more suitable for non-parental birds as compared to parental birds. But mainly what I want us to see here is the one of those, that larger restoration area I mentioned, Great Gun, is um, predicting is more suitable for parental birds than for non-parental birds. And given that these sites were created as nesting habitat, um, again, it seems that they were performing how they should be. And so to summarize what we found here, um, we saw that um, both parental and non-parental plovers were avoiding areas of um, higher elevation and steeper slopes. They wanted to be closer to the ocean intertidal, farther from vegetation and development. But in terms of the proportion of dry sand around um, an area, parental birds wanted more dry sand, whereas non-parental birds wanted less. And in terms of the bay intertidal, um, parental plovers wanted to be um, closer to the bay, whereas um, non-parental plovers were not exhibiting selection for this site. And so we think that most of this boils down, of course, to relationships avoiding predators, specifically in terms of uh, vegetation and development, and then air selecting for areas closer to foraging habitat. So um, lower elevation, flatter sites are, are more likely to um, be moist and thus have higher invertebrate abundances. Um, the ocean intertidal, while, it, um, while also moist, might have rack that also has higher invertebrate abundances. Um, and then vegetation and development could both harbor um, terrestrial and aerial predators, such as foxes or, or gulls. And so coming back to what we found for, um, from our population model is that reproductive output is also important to population growth in this population. But reproductive output, of course, is made up of both nest success and chick survival. However, in our population, the majority of nests are protected um, from predators by these wire exclosures um, that are erected around them. And so, um, and in nest survival models, this comes out as the most important um, predictor of nest success. So we instead chose to focus on the chick rearing period. As you can imagine, the chick pre-fledge period is highly um, sensitive and dynamic in plover chicks. So during this time, they hatch from eggs as these um, fluffy little, little adorable little nuggets. And um, 
but they can quickly uh, learn to forage um, for themselves, although they can't thermoregulate. Soon um, after hatch, about 10 weeks or so, they transition into this awkward um, teenager phase. And then within 25 to 30 days, they're these sleek, beautiful fledglings that can fly around for themselves. We also know that um, survival of plover chicks varies by habitat. Um, chicks who are fatter and forage more ultimately both survive better to fledge and throughout their life. And so we knew that it was important for piping plover chicks not just to look at their habitat preferences, but also to understand their behavior and their survival. We predicted that they would exhibit similar relationships to adults, right? So they would want to be closer and um, do better in moist intertidal habitats. Um, they would be able to survive better in open areas um, farther from vegetation, but that they would also be doing better in areas of lower predation risk or times of lower predation risk. So for the chick rearing period, we specifically looked at um, three things. So habitat selection, we used the same methods as we did for adults, um, except we didn't look at behavior, we just looked for um, variation among years. Um, we also looked at behavior. Um, sorry, the lights keep going out. <laughs> um, for this, we used um, foraging rates. So the number of times um, a chick uh, attempts to forage within a minute. Um, for this, we use linear mixed effects models um, where we use the same predictors for habitat selection, except we also included the actual habitat type that broods were in um, during that uh, behavior observation, as well as a local indicator of nesting piping plover density to try to get at some of those density dependent effects. And then finally, we evaluated uh, plover chick survival. We used the same uh, young survival model as we did in the population model. And we used, again, the same predictors as we did for habitat selection, um, except we included, again, that density. Um, metric as well as a pre or post mange indicator um, to understand if, if chick survival was higher following um, a reduction in the red fox population. We use the same spatial data as we did for adults, except this time we are collecting locations of chicks and we are also conducting behavioral observations for five minutes, recording every time a chick um, attempted to forage, so if they pecked, if they drank, um, or if they were probing around in the sand. And so what did we find? We found that uh, selection um, by chicks did vary among years. Um, many variables were important in at least one year that we looked at. Um, however, I just want to narrow in on two. So the proportion of vegetation and the slope. So for vegetation proportion around, um, around points, we see that similar to adults, piping plover chicks are avoiding vegetation. However, this was variable among years. So in early years of the study, in the more peachy yellow um, lines, we can see that use ceases around 25% um, vegetation around locations. However, as we um, move along in our study, as the island starts to revegetate, we see that chicks are maybe becoming more tolerant of vegetation, um, thus exhibiting um, plasticity towards this. So if there's not a lot of vegetation, they're not going to go near it, but if they don't have a lot of choice, maybe, maybe it's okay. Just, just some. We also saw in each year they were um, avoiding areas of steeper slopes, um, and again, the effect of, th the effect of this was greater um, later on in the study, um, which could be due to changing distributions of broods. Um, as I said, the population in increased, so we saw plover chicks in, in places we didn't have them before. In terms of behavior, um, we saw that the actual habitat type that the chicks were in during these behavioral observations was the most influential um, to um, peck rates. And we saw that in moist habitats or in rack, they were foraging more than in dry habitats, whether or not they were vegetated. We also saw that chicks were um, foraging less at higher elevations, and they were foraging less at higher piping plover nesting densities. 
And then in terms of survival to fledge, um, we found that um, similar to past studies, earlier hatched broods had a higher probability of surviving to fledge. Um, older chicks also had a higher probability of surviving. We found that uh, the more dry sand around locations um, actually reduced survival, so they were probably doing better if they were able to access that intertidal habitat. And then we also found indications of um, negative effects of plover density on chick survival. And we found that chicks following the mange outbreaks were surviving better um, than before the mange outbreak. And so to summarize this section, um, generally we saw that moist, flat, low elevation sites far from elevation were better for chick selection um, behavior as well as survival. However, um, plover chicks were also benefiting from areas of lower piping plover nesting densities. And so, um, although our population hasn't continued to increase, we're beginning to see signs of negative density dependence where we have looked for it, the only place, on chicks, such that survival and behavior of plover broods is negatively influenced by plover density. So what we can look at here is if we have one plover pair that's all by itself on one side of an inlet, as compared to um, a bunch of plover broods um, that are all packed together on another side, um, this plover brood might be doing better than these one which might be having questionable survival. However, because we also saw an influence of the red fox um, decline on this population, it's going to be really important to, continuing this, to continue this monitoring to understand which one of these is actually the most influential. And so I hope that these three chapters have shown you that there is variation among life stages on the breeding grounds for piping plovers. And that we need to consider all life stages when we manage for plovers on the breeding grounds. Um, so today I talked about adults and chicks, um, and then you can tune in on Tuesday to hear Katie talk about some nests and fledglings. As I said, they're beautiful and she'll show you that. And so continuing to track these changes in habitat selection and survival for all stages um, is going to be important moving forward as this population reaches carrying capacity and either stabilizes or declines. And so to bring all of this together, um, I think on Fire Island, um, one way to consider multiple life stages is in um, habitat protections. So I think we're doing a really good job of protecting nesting habitat. So as I said, they're putting up those exposures around nests, but they also fence off large areas um, as potential nesting habitat. However, for plover um, adults and chicks, particularly in the non-nesting stage, we could be doing um, a better job. So this might include putting up um, signs, as we've seen it in a couple of our sites, to educate the public on, on maybe why the beach isn't being managed exactly how they would like it. But also um, increasing the duration of times when the, nest, uh, the um, islands are closed to beach driving, as well as enforcing those closures. Ultimately, regard, regardless of whether or not we protect these habitats, we need to make sure there actually is habitat out there. So we need um, open, sparsely vegetated um, sand, as well as moist intertidal foraging habitat that's flat and not steep. And although we can create some of these um, habitat types with uh, vegetation removal, um, mechanical or herbicide, we can also um, build habitat for plovers. Um, ultimately, rather than stabilizing the islands, um, we could be just allowing the storms to come in and manage these, um, these habitats themselves. And I think ultimately, although this talk was all about piping plovers, these um, habitat changes or changes in management would, um, will affect all sorts of life um, on these islands. So the um, other nesting birds on the island, such as oyster catchers or lease terns, um, the migratory birds that come through, such as the federally threatened roof or red knot, but also the adorable plants that um, are on the island as well, such as the federally threatened sea beach amaranth. Uh, so with that, um, I would like to thank our primary funders, so the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, for being just excellent to work with. 
um, all these years and supporting us. Also the Virginia Tech Graduate School, all our other collaborators, land managers. Um, this has been such a widespread and collaborative project and I, I feel so lucky to have worked with so many excellent folks throughout this time. Also everybody in the Virginia Tech Shorebird program and I don't know if you noticed, but there are some pretty pictures in this um, talk and I did not take all of them. So <laughs> all the folks that um, let me use their photos for this. I, of course, need to thank uh, my major advisors, Jim Fraser and Dan Catlin. Um, I want to thank you so much for this opportunity, um, for bringing me on in 2012, where I was just fresh out of school, um, to, to just a few years later trusting me with this huge New York project. Sometimes your advising styles were night and day, um, but I think that your different strategies benefit all of us. Um, also to my committee members, Sarah Carpentier and Steve Prisley, um, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you. Um, always a, a kind, um, kind word and smile, and uh, it's been great. I also need to thank all the other mentors I've had throughout my time um, through school. So my master's advisor, Dave Hocus, my undergraduate advisor, Morty Ortega, um, Margaret Rubega, Brett Sandercock, uh, Beth Ross, Mindy Rice. You've all just believed in me when I didn't necessarily believe in myself. Um, and I hope I, I get to continue to work with all of you in the future. Um, I want to thank all of the great technicians we've had on the Fire Island project over the years, um, specifically the three crews that I had the pleasure um, of working with for the five month field seasons. I want to thank all of my friends that I've made through grad school, um, both at Virginia Tech and Kansas State. Um, it's been a great time. I hope it continues to be a great time, and I, I absolutely love all of you. I need to give a special shout out to uh, my field partners, so Katie Walker, Hen Bellman, and Kat Black. Um, it's, it's been absolutely remarkable how much we've grown over the last uh, four and a half years. Um, we've learned, we've eaten a lot of empanadas and bagels. Um, yeah, and, and thank you so much for being so wonderful. Uh, I need to thank my fr friends and family um, from back home and, and those have become family while I've been here. Um, I'm so grateful for all of your support. And then finally, I need to thank my husband, uh, Sean, who um, moved here to Virginia from Canada. Um, so that in itself is, is something, but who I also dragged to New York with us for two seasons. Um, I, I couldn't have done this without your support. Um, and I'd love to, like to also thank you for letting me get two cats um, that also came to the field with us for two years. And as you can see here, they work really hard. Um, taking notes, using the boat bean bags, working on the computer, doing sticky sticks. Um, so thank you so much for everybody. Um, even if I didn't mention you, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, and yeah, with that, we can take questions. Um, as Jim said earlier, um, for questions, we are going to um, just ask that you ask them in the chat and then I'll read them out loud um, and, and we can answer any questions that way. Let me see. I'm sure you're all, all clapping uh, uproariously there at home, so thanks, Sam, for that presentation. <laughs> I, need, I need to find the chat. Thank you. Excellent job. Ooh, I found it. So much flattery. How they all oh, Great job. Jay, can you show the chat line here? Oh, I found it. Yeah, if you just go down to the bottom of the screen. You probably need to um, share a different screen. Like you're probably sharing this view right now. Well, like I just have to. They can see this. Yeah, if you want to share. Right, but if you just stick your finger oh, down to the bottom of the screen. Claire, Claire and George have just asked you questions, so. Okay, um, <clears throat> so Claire, how did we calculate adult emigration? Um, so we had those fidelity terms um, from our model, which we calculated, um, those are terms in the model. We do get um, a huge amount of recites of our birds that nest elsewhere. Um, 
So we specifically called fidelity if you were um, in the study area and we saw you, but also if you bred. So we were also sort of contributing to those um, ancillary recites. Um, so that is how we did that. And then George, hi George, um, said immigration strongly contributing to population growth. Where are they coming from? Um, that's a really good question. There's not a ton of other banding that's happening out there. Um, we have had three um, immigrants from the New Jersey population. So Michelle Stanchel has been working um, in New Jersey concurrent with our time in New York. And so we know we're getting some of her birds. Um, I would suspect they're also coming locally from New York. Um, this year we um, we had a piping plover meeting and in New York um, the population increased about the same number of pairs as our own study area did. Um, so we're probably stealing some birds from other sites there. Um, how did our post Sandy, this is John Vanek's question, um, John, you did great the other day. Um, how did your post-Sandy population increase compare to other populations during the same period? Um, we, so following per Hurricane Sandy, we were definitely seeing um, a greater population change um, than other sites, but I don't know exactly. Um, I think the increase in the New York, New Jersey study area, or um, recovery unit was maybe about 30%. Um, so our population is increasing. Um, more and faster. Um, let's see. Diane asked if we noticed noise pollution had an effect on nesting plovers. Um, I did not notice that. Um, I would say, so we didn't do behavioral observations on um, adults. We just recorded the behavior that they were exhibiting when we first saw them. Um, and uh, I, I wouldn't say we have a ton of noise pollution um, in our study area. During most of the breeding period, the, um, it's closed to um, driving. It's, it's not a, a huge, it's, we're not that close to New York City. Um, so I would say I didn't notice that, um, but it would be interesting to look at. Um, Paul? My father-in-law said, Sam, are the piping plovers still endangered and what is being done to increase the population? They are still threatened. Um, all sorts of things are being done, such as by putting up beach closers, um, you know, uh, lots and lots of predator removal um, in places across the breeding range, um, creating habitat. Um, so it's an all fronts conservation effort and uh, yeah, and we're still going. They are, they are getting closer to recovery goals um, in certain parts of the recovery unit. Um, Heather asked, if our habitat selection, did we incorporate random effects? Um, so no, um, we, didn't, uh, we didn't have enough uh, locations per individual to um, estimate home ranges, and so we were generally just looking at a population level um, selection, rather what the birds were um, selecting for within their home range. And we used um, five times as many random points as we did uh, real points. This is weird. I can't like see what anybody's reactions are. So I don't know if I'm answering. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, we did incorporate random effects in the um, chick behavior model, so um, nest and subsite specific uh, random effects. Here's a follow-up question. They might unmute, unmute into a world. They could. It just keeps going. There's 12 new messages. Yeah. No, no, that's great. Keep I think going. in some ways people are asking more questions. Every time. Until you get tired of <laughs> so this question was, what are your thoughts on how well aerial photographs could pick up vegetation at the lowest levels of density? Um, yeah, so that's a really interesting question. I think it's one that we're still trying to understand. So um, we collect aerial imagery um, both in the spring and in the fall following um, vegetation growth. So our aerial images in the spring are in 
uh, March or April, and then our fall images are in um, September. So it definitely needs further study. Um, our aerial images are 15 centimeter resolution. So it's pretty fine if you can imagine 15 centimeters is about the size of a piping plover nest. Um, again, shout out to Katie's talk on Tuesday. Um, so I think that if there's vegetation there, um, it's very likely to pick it up at that scale. Um, if it's a blade of grass, I'm not sure it could pick that up, but I'm also not sure how important that would be to a piping plover. Um, <laughs> Um, it was Scott Klopfer. Okay. Um, we have a question from Lisa Gatti. Sorry if I say your name wrong. In terms of the restoration areas, can you talk about the lack of restoration maintenance and future trends in terms of the parameters you studied? Yeah, so um, one of our restoration areas, the smaller one, quickly um, was taken over by Phragmites. Um, it was not used after 2017, um, and that was likely why. Um, I think that that area specifically is also, um, has a high probability of being occupied by foxes, so they might um, be responding to that. Um, Phragmites, of course, is really, really hard to manage, um, and I think that there have been some challenges there. Um, in terms of great gun, it is definitely revegetating. It is not at the same level of vegetation as much uh, uh, as the rest of our study area. Um, there has been some efforts to do um, smaller scale vegetation maintenance um, in the restoration areas. Um, I know they tried herbicide one year. Um, in terms of uh, how, it's, how it's responding, um, you know, the, I think there was eight pairs in Great Gun in 2018 and then 13 pairs in Great Gun in 2019. So it doesn't necessarily seem like the lack of vegetation maintenance at this time is, is inhibiting their use of that site. That being said, um, eventually all of that area will be vegetated if they don't do something or if another storm doesn't come through um, and change the landscape. Um, let's see. Diane said that there was record-breaking pairs nests and chick survival on Sandy Hook, New Jersey. Um, I assume that means following Hurricane Sandy. So yeah, the hurricane definitely um, affected more than just Fire Island, <laughs> as I think New York City would notice. Oh, is that how it was? That's hilarious. Um, Robert Alonzo said, do you think habitat selection is a function of behavior or is behavior potentially a function of habitat selection? That is, do individuals change their behaviors dependent upon nesting habitat across years? Um, yeah, so we looked for variation um, among years in adult habitat selection as well. It just wasn't supported. Um, piping plovers are extremely site fidelic. Um, they will nest within, um, we've had a pair that nested uh, 0.2 meters um, from, each, from nesting attempts across years. Um, so I think that that might be what we're seeing there in terms of not seeing differences in habitat selection among years. Um, but um, for that chapter, we also only used three years. We used um, when I started on the project is when we started collecting uh, fine scale locations of the adults. Um, so I think if we, you know, use more years and, and track habitat selection as um, the island changes even more. So we have those data now from 2019, um, depending on how everything goes, we hope to be going back this year, but we're not sure. Um, so I think we, we need more years and, and more changes in habitat before we can properly answer that question. Um, Lisa Gaddy is my cover, Steve Papa. <laughs> 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 um, it's 11 o'clock. Do we have to stop? Mm -hmm.
Hen said, sorry, I need to take a drink. To follow up on that question, are chicks truly becoming more tolerant of vegetation in more recent years or responding to increased plover density? Um, so I think that's a great question. I want to include plover density um, in chick selection as well. However, um, I only spent two weeks in the field in 2019, but I saw chicks running in and out of dense veg for sure in ways that I hadn't seen in the past. So I think that um, as there's more vegetation and less open sand, if their adults choose to put their nest somewhere, then the chicks don't really have a ton of choice about where else to go unless they're led there. Um, so I think that, um, I think it's probably both. Um, Cool. Brandon Semmel said, what does competition look like between plovers and other shorebirds in the area? Um, do you think it helps or hurts? Um, so in terms of other shorebirds, we do see um, antagonistic interaction between plovers and oyster catchers. Um, you know, least terns will also dive bomb um, plovers and oyster catchers. Um, and we've also seen, um, we have an directly observed it, but we suspect in a couple of cases oyster catchers have actually um, quote-unquote predated piping plover nests. So I don't know that they ate the eggs, but they certainly destroyed them. Um, so I think in that way it can hurt, um, hurt the population, um, but I do think that the least turn colonies can potentially at least um, distract from piping plovers. So if there's, you know, a hundred least turns in an area and one piping plover pair, um, probabilistically they're going to probably predate least turns um, before um, piping plovers. Probably have time for just a couple more questions. Um, so it looks like we just have one more, it's from Kat, who said, could the increased tolerance of vegetation also be related to the predator die-off? I think absolutely, 100%, and I think you and I should work on this more. Um, we've seen, you know, even nests move closer to vegetation um, as it increased, um, and I think that something I didn't mention is that we've seen a high degree of aerial predation in our study area um, after the fox die off. So we don't know at this time if it's a, a density effect um, or if there's just a lot more plovers and thus we're detecting more predation by aerial predators. But one hypothesis we've thrown around is that um, as terrestrial predators are no longer a huge concern, aerial predators become a concern, they're moving towards the vegetation in reaction to um, that primary um, predator change. Um, I think that's all the questions. Thank you everybody for all your kind words. Um, and we are gonna go uh, socially distance ourselves in a room and finish this up. Jim, do you wanna say anything? No, I'll just say uh, thanks to everybody for coming in this uh, unusual format. And uh, so, uh, so we had 63 people, I think it said, uh, attending this way, so that's great. And so now we'll go and Sam will have the rest of her big day in uh, semi-solitude. <laughs> Thanks all. Yep, thank you everybody for coming. Um.